Right. Um, uh, good afternoon, folks. Um, very, uh, very welcome. And um, I'm delighted to find you all here. Um, <clears throat> uh, what um, you've signed up for is an, an, an introductory conversation to the, or rather sort of a discussion or, or um, lecture on the caring growth approach to human excellence. Just a little bit of background of this. Uh, uh, first of all, just, you know, how are we going to handle our conversation today is um, the, the, the rules of our game is, are basically, uh, uh, please keep your, um, your, your mic muted and your camera off um, for now. I mean, unless we sort of direct it otherwise. Um, also, <clears throat> if you could move, um, if you put your, uh, uh, that's uh, that small sort of icon of uh, the second icon on the left from the left of your of your sort of video display so you can see see me but move that little icon to the top right hand side of your screen that leaves space for the slide because a lot of this content is actually driven in a slideshow um, and um, if you have questions please do interact via uh, the chat box I'd probably take as a, respond to the questions at the end of the discussion, but as it occurs to you, or at the end of the presentation, as the questions occur to you, though, you're very welcome to add them to the chat box. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit about, uh, about me. Um, and clearly, that photograph was taken a little while back, so I, I'm, um, there's a few less teeth and a few more gray hair. In fact, right now, less hair. Um, uh, but... Um, uh, I'm Itzko Skatema. I'm the founder of this business called Skatema, um, and it was established in 1990. Um, and it was established uh, on the basis of, or rooted in research that I conducted with um, a group of colleagues from an organization called the Chamber of Mines Research Organization um, <clears throat> in the 80s. I was employed by one of the laboratories in this organization called the Human Resources Laboratory in 1982, uh, specifically to conduct research in the area of employee discontent and conflict, which as you can imagine in South Africa in the early 80s, this was a very significant issue because we was basically sitting through a low-level civil war. Um, and that, um, that work eventually kind of developed into an understanding of the whole problem of commitment uh, in organizations and uh, we've on the basis of that work we developed a raft of content which um, relate to the issue of human and organizational excellence and it includes a number of core uh, models that we've developed um, among others the intent model of maturation and the caring growth leadership model but there are more um, our business has, um, uh, we, have, I mean, we've conducted work throughout the world. I mean, 29 countries is the last count. Um, and we've got three operating businesses in, this, in, our, in our organization. The mothership runs from South Africa. Um, uh, and then we also have an operating business in Pakistan and an operating business in, uh, in Sweden with a few more kind of being developed on the way. Uh, most uh, probably uh, Australia and Canada, and possibly a, a small operation in New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> and we, I mean, we've had we've got a really diverse client base that we've developed over the last uh, thirty odd years. I mean, we've worked in every conceivable industry, from mining through to manufacturing, through financial services, um, development organisations. I mean, there's, there's not too many places that we haven't worked in. So that's us. And um, we've, um, <clears throat> we, I'm increasingly convinced that um, the, uh, you, you know, the key thing that you're trying to crack when you're looking at the issue of transformation in organizations is that you're trying to, you need to shift the narrative of how people envisage an organization. Um, you know, there's been a lot since the mid 70s, um, sort of rooted in work done by the Tavistock Institute and so on. There's an increasing drive to, if you like, have a more humane approach to people. Um, there's been sort of a, you know, a, a, a wave of inclu increasingly collaborative approaches to dealing with people at work. 
and we had the fad of the of um, uh, participative management in the 80s that then turned to, into in the late 80s these various experiments with um, self-directed work teams and what was really driving that is a, an an, in, a, a, an intent to shift the nature of the relationship between boss and subordinate at work and and, and parallel to that there's an increasing growth of the sort of the the language of 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 hierarchy at work being more concerned with leadership than management it's almost like being uh, leading people is considered to be a little bit on pc or rather managing people is considered to be a little bit on pc today now the, the problem is that very often these these approaches while they are well intended they end up being experienced as cosmetic and they experience this cosmetic because you need to actually do more than just change the way in which you view the relationship between boss and subordinate at work. There's the whole way of envisaging the, the enterprise that needs to shift. We, we must stop seeing enterprises as systems or machines, the sort of mechanical metaphor that's based in the 19th sort of century that, that kind of work to achieve a result. We must see enterprises as villages, as cities and as communities of people who collaborate to serve. And why is this issue of seeing enterprises as communities that collaborate to serve, why is that so important? Because it actually cracks the heart of the problem. Because actually, if you're trying to understand enterprise, then you have to understand that all enterprises are really there to serve customers and clients. So in other words, an, an enterprise isn't something that actually sits on a balance sheet. It's something that engages, it's about human beings engaging other human beings in order to serve them. And it doesn't matter what the nature of the enterprise is, whether it's a financial institution, whether it's a very high tech manufacturing concern, whether it's the guy who's selling uh, groceries in a, or vegetables in a, in, a, in, a, in a market. We're all there. All enterprises are people serving people. And when you see it from that point of view, you actually have an opportunity to actually crack the essence, if you like, of what successful enterprise should be about. If you envisage an enterprise as a collective, collective of people that are actually structured or stacked in, if you like, hierarchically with regard to each other. I mean, you can think of an organization as an inverted cone. And because it's hierarchical, there's fewer people at the top than at the bottom. And, and really, if you're trying to understand or measure the success of this enterprise, and particularly the contribution that the enterprise makes to the world, then we have to understand that that contribution is really, there's a granular character to that because no collective has an intent. Individual human beings have an intent. So how this intent to serve actually gets translated is really carried by each individual in the enterprise and that intent to serve then also accounts for the, even the financial success of an enterprise. Because if you say, you know, how do you measure the financial success of an enterprise? And clearly, if an, a, 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 you know, a successful enterprise produces a surplus. And in a sense, what does that mean? We have this three baker analogy. So let's assume you've got three bakers who collaborate to bake a cake. It takes them a whole month to bake this cake. And at the end of the month, the cake is sold. And each one of them takes a slice home at the end of the month to feed their family. Now, the question is, what, what's the slice, the slice that's left? We would call the slice that's left a surplus. And intuitively, we would measure the success of this enterprise vis-a-vis -vis the size of this slice, or uh, with regard to the size of the slice vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the cake. I mean, the bigger the slice is with regard to the rest of the cake, the more successful we'll deem the enterprise to be. Now, if this is true, we need to ask ourselves why that slice exists in the first place. And surely that slice only exists because the total cake that was baked was bigger than what each individual took home. In other words, collectively, have these people given more than what they've taken or have they taken more than what they've given? And clearly, they've given more than what they've taken, which suggests that any surplus is the measure of the degree to which the average person in the group has gone the extra mile, has made a discretionary contribution in pursuit of the group's objectives. So the success of the collective is seated in the intent of the individual. And if you ask yourself, well, what do you need to do to an organization to enable this intent in the individual, then, then actually the first thing you need to understand is that this then has to relate to how groups operate in the organization. So 
I mean, if, you, if we looked at our hierarchy and we took a, a kind of a horizontal cut through the hierarchy, um, you know, we would then basically be dealing with a, with, with a team, with a peer group. This intent to give or serve translates into how teams deal with each other in an organization. I mean, if you consider uh, peers at any level in an organization, um, you know, really operate like a sports team, like, uh, like a soccer team, for example. And the character of that team can have one of two characteristics. It can either be constituted by interactions where each individual is trying to get as much as they can for giving as it was possible, or interactions where, 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 where um, an individual is trying to set somebody else up to succeed. And it's based on the second possibility that the team succeeds. I mean, if you think about what accounts for a successful soccer team, for example, you know, like a, a soccer player at a professional level, I mean, surely most of the work that happens on the field isn't about somebody scoring. It's about somebody trying to set somebody else up to score. So it's that magnanimity of spirit. I'm not here for myself. I'm here for my colleague. I'm here to set my colleague up to succeed. When you have that in a team, you've got a successful team. But when each player is playing for his own interests, you basically have, you don't have a team. You've got a herd of cats. So what makes a team is this possibility of the individual team leader to be in the group to set their colleague up to succeed. Now, <clears throat> our view is that, that there are three, three reasons that account for this possibility of people being there to set each other up to succeed. And they're kind of in ascending order in terms of my understanding at least. The first, the first reason is that there's a culture of good citizenship in the group. And what I mean by that is that um, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, some cultures are just better at, cult of, at enabling collaborative people than others. And, and so my, my favorite example at the moment, and I'm sure it'll stay my favorite example for many years to come, is the Swedes. You know, I mean, uh, you know, having had um, increasing contact with Sweden and Swedish people, I keep on being really uh, sort of amazed by them. You know, I mean, if you, Consider, uh, you know, how many people there are in the country. There's like 10 million of them stuck on just just south of the Tundra. You know, you know, it's like like far up, and 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 these 10 million people have made the most extraordinary contribution to the the rest of us as, as a species. I mean, if you consider the brands they've offered the world, you know, there's Volvo and Saab and SKF and Ericsson and and the Scania and the uh, H&M uh, and Spotify. This raft of of contributions that these, these people have made to the world. You know, I mean, and, and with a population which is half the size of the population of the city that I live in, this tiny population stuck on just south of the tundra have made this extraordinary contribution to the world. Why? Because if there's one thing that the Swedes do understand is basically, um, you know, how to collaborate with people. You know, they um, the behavior that in a South African context, which is why, where I'm from, would be considered to be perfectly normal. You know, make sure that you've put that guy in his place or you, you've sort of gutted that guy like a fish in the meeting. That just would be unacceptable in the Swedish context. The Swedes really do understand collaboration. So if, you, if you're trying to account for this possibility that of people being there to go the extra mile, you cannot discount this cultural variable. I mean, there's a number of other examples one can think of, but um, the Swedish one is the one that comes closest to mind for me right now. The second possibility uh, that accounts for this, this possibility of people going the extra mile is that the group has a benevolent intent. Now, what I mean by this is, is uh, the easiest way to explore this idea is by way of thought experiment. So let's assume you worked for a, a pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline, and I'm your boss. And I said to you, listen, please work very hard at making the drugs that we make in this business. Um, uh, because if you do, then you'll help to make a shareholder on the London Stock Exchange shamefully rich. You know, how are you going to feel about that? I mean, you're probably going to spit in the mix, as you should, because it's insulting. But, you know, but if I said to you, um, please work very hard at making these drugs, because if you do, you'll help to save millions of lives throughout the world. I mean, clearly, you'll be a lot more committed to the making of these drugs. And that's what we mean by benevolent intent. I mean, if you're trying to create the conditions where people are going to act for a reason which is bigger than their self-interest, you better give them a reason which is noble enough for them to do that. You better give them a reason that makes them feel it's worthwhile suspending their self-interests. 
You know, that's what we call by benevolent intent. It's really concerned with how the enterprise makes a contribution to the world. Whose life do you make better by doing by what you do? However, the last reason for people to go the extra mile really is concerned with how the group is led. Because, I mean, in my experience, people don't go the extra mile for organizations. People go the extra mile for people. So if you want to understand the conditions under which people will make a discretionary contribution to the enterprise, don't ask yourself, what's the organization you're going to work for? They're going to work for because they want to, but who's the boss they work for because they want to. And in my experience, this is exactly where we start to hit a very serious problem in most enterprises, because it really then is concerned. This refers to how the, the average boss or leader sees their role. And if you ask the average boss or leader to kind of describe how they see their role, what they would say to you is kind of, and so I've taken this body of content straight off um, a recent program that I trained. So this is what people said. And if you go through this material, you'll find two variables. First of all, there's something that has to do with kind of people, like compassionate towards people, having emotional intelligence, di directing people, trusting. It's about people. But there's also a second theme in this, which is about an outcome. And in fact, there's one particular statement that sort of holds most of the content in this uh, material, and that is directing people towards achieving a result. And that is true how most people see leadership. Most people, if you ask them to define the word, they're going to say leadership is about achieving a result through people. That's how we envisage the task of having a hierarchical relationship with somebody. Now, the problem is that if the average boss in the hierarchy has this view of their role, they will not cultivate people who come to work to make a contribution to the enterprise or to make a discretionary contribution to the enterprise. They will cultivate takers. This way of viewing hierarchy is immensely toxic and is actually at the root of a lot of the cynicism that we have in organizational life today. And why is that? Because, <clears throat> let's do a bit of a thought experiment on this. So what, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you, I'm going to present you with two scenarios and I'd like you to work out which one of these bosses would you work for because you want to and which one would you work for because you have to. So scenario one, this, so you're, the first person is, uh, uh, is Fred. Fred is your subordinate. And you say you're very experienced in a job that Fred have to do because number one, you're kind of my, my age mate. So it would be conceivable that you could say to Fred, Fred in 1980, I did what you have to do now and what I did work. Don't, um, you know, go and, uh, don't argue with me, go and do what I did. That's what you say to Fred. Joe, you say to Joe, Joe in 1980, I did what you have to do now and what I did work. Um, it may be helpful to you to take a look at, take a look at it. Now, if the question is, which one of these two people are likely to work for you because they have to, and which is likely to, to work for you because they want to? And in fact, if you consider that, and, uh, Joe will work for you because he wants to, and Fred will work for you because he, he has to. And if you ask the average boss, so, well, what makes those two engagements different? The key thing that will come up in the conversation is, so, well, listen, Joe's got a decision. Joe can make a decision that Fred can't make. So your approach with Joe is far more democratic and kind of participative. Whereas in Fred, it's, it's kind of like dictatorial and autocratic. And all of this is true, of course. But the problem is that viewing the distinction between the Fred and Joe into action as purely just a, a behavioral difference doesn't cut deep enough. In order to understand what the distinction really is about, you need to separate two variables in your mind, means and ends. And you need to put into those two categories either the person is doing the job or the job that's being done. So... If we examine the Fred into action, if you said to Fred, Fred, in 1980, I did what you have to do now and what I did worked, don't argue with me, go do what I did. Then basically, you're, what you're trying to achieve is you're trying to get the same job done than what you did in 1980. And by definition, the person, Fred, is becoming your means, your resource to get the job done. If we assume that you're, you're not lying to Joe, you mean what you say, your intent is consistent with what's coming out of your mouth. If you said to Joe, Joe, in 1980, I did what you have to do now, what I did worked, it may be helpful to you take a look at it. Could you have a different outcome from what you had in 1980? And yes, you could have a, a very different outcome. In fact, that outcome could be a disaster, could be a complete catastrophic mess. 
So your end in this interaction isn't to get the same job done than what you did in 1980. Your end is basically to teach Joe something. You, you try to be helpful to Joe. And what gives you the opportunity to teach him something is the job that he's doing. So there's a peculiar inversion, which is operative kind of under the surface that you're not, that doesn't immediately, isn't immediately apparent. In the Fred case, you're using the person as your means to get the job done. Whereas in the Joe case, you're using the job as your means in order to enable the person. Now that inversion of means and ends actually gives the game away because it tells you that there's a shift in the intent of the engagement. If you were Fred, I mean, you always interrogate the issue of intent by asking yourself whose experience does the beneficiary of this interaction. If you were Fred, who would you experience as being the beneficiary? Well, actually you'd experience that the boss was the beneficiary. So from Fred's point of view, the boss is trying to take something from him. If you were Joe, who would you experience as the beneficiary? Well, actually, you'd, Joe would experience himself as the beneficiary. The boss, the, the Joe experiences that the boss is there to give him something. Now, if we if we defined leadership consistently with this lens, if we said leadership is about achieving a result through people, and that's how we viewed it, then which one of these two interactions are we talking about? The Fred interaction and the Joe interaction. And clearly. We're talking the Fred interaction because this statement uh, is structured in such a way that the person is the means and the, the job, the result is the end. So the problem is that when we con our current way of looking at leadership, is, which says that leadership is about achieving a result through people, basically turns people into the means in order to achieve a result. That intent is a take intent. And people don't give to takers. That stands to reason. So if you want people to come to, go, to work to make a discretionary effort to the, the, the business, then you've got, the leader has to change how they view their role. I mean, if we wanted to have a framing of this, this, this relationship between boss and subordinate to be consistent with the Joe interaction, then basically what you'd have to say, and it'd be quite a shocker, you'd have to say something like, leadership is about achieving people through results. Now, <clears throat> most people would consider that statement to be so outrageous and bizarre, it doesn't even sound like English. But I'd like to suggest that's exactly the penny that has to drop in the consciousness of anybody in a hierarchical position if we're going to cultivate a collective where the average person comes to work to make, to be of service, to make a discretionary contribution to the enterprise. Now, to make sense out of the statement, actually, and to indicate just that, you know, how unoutrageous it actually is, becomes apparent if we just shift context for a moment and have a look at what happens between the, the, the coach and the athlete in any team sport. So like soccer, for example, because this is exactly what a coach does. You know, I mean, if you, if you play for a, a, a team, a soccer team, and your coach came to you one day saying, listen, folks, I mean, understand my job as the coach is to achieve a result. And I'm going to use you, the players, as my resources to achieve that result. You know, I mean, how would you play for this coach? I, I tell you how I'd play. I'd loosen his wheel nuts. I mean, who do you think you are, Mr. Coach? Surely, whose job is it to produce a result? Well, actually, it's the team's job. Does that mean to say the coach doesn't have a job? Well, he does have a job, but his job isn't to produce a result. His job is to coach the team. Now, that doesn't mean to say the coach has no interest in the game that's being played or the result that's being produced. You know, I mean, because you can't coach a game if you don't know what's happening on the field and you don't know what's happening on the scoreboard. But it doesn't make those two things the coach's job. It makes those two things the coach's means to do his job, which is to coach the player. The coach doesn't use the player as his means to achieve a result. He uses the result as his means to enable the player. A coach indeed does crack this code. He says that leadership is about achieving people through results. The coach is deliverable. The coach's product is extraordinary athletes. And he uses the game as his gymnasium to do that. Now, I mean, in my experience, folks, when this penny has dropped in the consciousness of a leadership team, and I've seen this over decades now, when they suddenly understand that their deliverable is not the result or even the job that's being done by this business, their deliverable is the excellence of the people who report to them and that the job that's being done is their gymnasium to make them excellent people. From that point of view, that organization takes off. 
And that doesn't mean to say that the coach is always nice because a good coach isn't always nice and democratic. A good coach can be very hard, but in whose interest? In the interest of the player. So, um, <clears throat> now we've done quite a bit of work over the years um, to kind of understand really what, you know, what sort of boss would people work for because they really want to. Who is that boss? And, and um, so what I've got here is, is, is a typical list of, of words and phrases that people would offer as a, def, uh, as a description of the boss that they would work for because they wanted to. Um, so you could ask any group this or any individual this. You kind of, you know, if you could have any, uh, any qualities in a boss, you know, sky's the limit. You decide exactly what you want. What would the person do for you? What would be in the relationship? And what do you have here? This is actually a, a list that I got off a group that I trained recently. And as you can see, it's quite an intimidating list of things. But the first thing that becomes apparent in that list is that there's, there's definitely synonyms in the list. Um, uh, and if there are synonyms in the list, it has to mean you can reduce the list. Because you, there, in other words, there's some ideas that kind of that, that form like anchors that you can cluster the rest around. And I think actually, if you do that job properly, if you do a distillation of this, you know, really analyze what's in there, there's actually only two themes in this list. The first theme has got a soft and a kind ring about it. So it's things like, you know, the boss is trustworthy, is supportive, who listens to my thoughts and is available. Somebody who's a support cares about me. You see how often the issue of listening comes up. And what this is saying to you is that what you say to this boss is, listen, don't just be in this relationship to pursue your own agenda. Don't just be in the re this relationship to get something out of me. Have a genuine interest in me. Care about me. So the first, this soft and kind theme is really about care. But then there's a harder theme. I mean, if you look at some of these other things, like, for instance, if you work for a boss who's always honest, I mean, surely that person isn't always going to be nice. You know, sometimes the person's going to say things to you that you find upsetting at the time. You say, well, 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 well then why would you want that? Do you like being upset? And clearly, you don't like being upset. So you, why do you want the honesty? Well, you want the honesty so that you, so that you can learn, so that you can grow. So the benefit to you of all of these harder themes is that you grow. Um, which is why you want the boss to uh, have a clarity of vision. Why you want the boss to be trusting. I mean, that doesn't, that sounds sweet, but not necessarily. Because if I trust you, I basically, I'm treating you like an adult. I'm saying I can entrust you with something. I'm making you accountable. I'm making you big, but, and I, I'm, I'm treat, you know, I'm, I, I'm growing you. Um, to inspire you, to coach you. I mean, that's almost a synonym for growth. So... If you work for somebody because you want to, folks, it's not because the person does, uh, you know, 50 things for you or the person only does two things for you, really. They give you, they care for you sincerely and they give you an opportunity to grow, care and growth. And what's interesting about those criteria is that they're absolutely universal. We've demonstrated this throughout the world. I mean, I've asked people this question, who's the boss you're going to work for because you want to since the early 80s? And I've asked this in organizations throughout the world. And everybody always says the same thing. Everybody says, if I work for a boss because I want to, distill it, it's care and growth. Now, we need to understand why these criteria are so universal. And in order to understand the universality of these criteria, we need to unpack what we're asking when we ask that question. I mean, that question is actually a very significant question. It's... Um, I mean, if you work for somebody because you want to, so let's assume uh, you work for, uh, for, for Joe Bloggs and you're very committed to Joe Bloggs. You work to Joe Blo for Joe Bloggs because you want to. And if I ask you, why do you work for Joe Bloggs? You say, well, and you say all this stuff. Joe Bloggs has a character, blah, 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 blah. He cares for me and grows me, right? Now, let's assume this Joe Bloggs comes to you one day and asks you to do something. What will you do? You'll do it. In other words, you give Joe Bloggs the right to ask you to do things or to exercise power over you, which basically suggests that these criteria of care and growth are the criteria for legitimate power. I mean, you see it from that point of view, the universality of the criteria make absolute sense. You know, the, the, the first relationship of power that you have with another human being is with your parents. 
And if it's the first relationship, it's a significant relationship. And what I mean by that is that <clears throat> that you we you know we can we we can understand the principle of a matter by examining the first manifestation of the matter. In fact, the Latin word for first is in the word, word principle. Uh, you know, um, so 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 if you want to understand the principle, examine the first manifestation. The first manifestation of power is parenting. In this relationship, there are two people. There's a parent, there's a big one, and there's a little one. The job of the big one for the little one is very specific. The parent has to care for the child and has to enable the child to grow. In other words, what this is suggesting, folks, is that the job of the big one for the little one in any hierarchical position is to care for and grow the subordinate. Because that is what Pi is supposed to do. We can tease a principle out of this. We call it the second axiom of the caring growth leadership model. Any relationship of power is legitimate if the aim of that relationship is the caring growth of the subordinate. And it doesn't matter where you find the power. It can be, be, be between the boss and the subordinate at work. It can be between the coach and the athlete in a, in a, in a team sport, between the teacher and the, and, and the pupil at school. Wherever you find hierarchy, we even find some person who's subordinate to the authority of somebody else. The subordinate person will only see that the big one has the right to be in charge if A, the big one is there to give to them, and specifically that giving is about their care and growth. What you have to understand about this care and growth though, is that it's not always about being nice. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, if you, so if you looked at some of those, the, stuff, the things that we indicate with growth, they're very often there's confrontation that's associated with that. And, and it kind of suggests that, that this is not about a laissez-faire kind of make everybody equal democratization of the workplace. I mean, that's not what we're arguing for here. Because if you look at, um, you, you know, uh, parenting, for instance, so there's two core metaphors that we're dealing with, the coaching metaphor and the parenting metaphor. You know, in, if you're, you know, what, what is the parent's role is to help the growth of the child? Well, surely, you know, I mean, if you have a nine-month-old child who's beginning to walk and the child has fallen a few times, you don't want the child to hurt themselves. So the next time the child gets up, you go over and you take the child's hand. You know, what are you trying to do with the hand? You're trying to support the child. So you're doing this in the child's interest, you know. Um, uh, uh, however, this hand of yours is also an autocratic imposition imposition of control. So it's entirely feasible to autocratically impose control in the interest of the person you're doing this to. However, you know, what skill are you trying to enable? Well, actually you're trying to enable the child to walk. Now, how can you find out the child can walk? Well, at some point you have to let go of the hand. But where do you stand? You stand close to the child. You don't stand on the other side of the room because growth by its nature is an incremental process. So if your intent is to grow the person, it's not about an absolute and democratic suspension of control. It's about an incremental suspension of control. So the next axiomatic principle that we tease out of this when we're looking at how hierarchy operates indicates that care and growth implies an incremental suspension of control to empower the subordinate. And there are immense practical implications to this for organizations because if you look at each incremental suspension of control, then kind of the, there's almost an intuitively sound logic that you've got to respect in order to kind of have to sort of enable this suspension of control. And we have um, a sort of, uh, again, based on kind of, uh, uh, sort, sort of, you know, out of folk mouth, if you like, uh, there's, you know, how do you empower somebody? Well, don't give a person a fish, enable them to fish, you know, teach them to fish. So if you say, well, how would you actually do that? If you needed to empower somebody to fish, what would you give them? Well, first of all, you'd give them a whole lot of stuff. Um, you'd give them a hook, a line, a sinker, and a bait, and a boat. And if it was a South African, you'd have to give them some beer. In fact, you'd probably have to also give them some brandy, etc. So you'd give a whole lot of stuff, you know. But then if you just left him with that stuff, he's going to be perfectly useless. You also have to teach him how to use it. You need to teach him how to bait a hook and where to cast and where you should fish. Now, if you say, well, what's the difference between these two categories? The first category really is about things, and that's why we call it means. Sometimes people say, well, it's like hardware. Eh? It sits outside of the person. The second kind of sits inside the person because it's really about the person's skill or knowledge. And we, therefore, we call the second category ability, which suggests 
that if you want to empower somebody, you've got to give them one of two things. You've got, well, you've, get, you've got to give them two things. Like you've got to give them the means to do what's required of them, and you have to make them able to do what's required of them. Now, the, the, the problem is that very often when, when I, sort of I deal with groups and I ask people this question, you know, how would you empower somebody to fish? We stop there. And this is inadequate. Because let's say you're dealing with me and I'm a particularly lazy person. And you want to, I mean, you're sincerely trying to empower me to fish. You give me all the means I could conceivably require to catch these fish, including the beer. You give me all the ability I could conceivably require. But because you're a nice person, you also have a freezer full of fish at home. And you say to me, after doing all of this stuff, you say to me, Ach, you know what, don't worry. If you don't catch a fish, I'll give you one from my freezer. Now, if that's what you say, if you don't catch a fish, I'll give you one from my freezer. How willingly am I going to fish? I'm not going to be very willing at all. In other words, what's the last thing you're going to bring to the party that actually engages my will? Well, actually, it's a kind of bloody mindedness. You know, if you don't catch a fish after this, starve. We call that accountability. In other words, folks, empowering people means three things and not just two. It means to give them the means to do what's required of them, to make them able to do what's required of them, and to hold them accountable. And if you don't do all three of those things, you don't empower people, you disable them. And unfortunately, I mean, well, not unfortunate, but consistent with the idea of means, it would be things like giving people the tools to do what's required of them, the resources, the authority, a clear standard, and so on. And it would also mean, you know, making them able, which means to give the per teach the person how they should do what's required of them and why they should do it. And our view is that the why is infinitely more important than the how, because if you understand why you should do something, you'll work out how. But if you understand how to do something, if you don't know why, why you should do it, the last thing I, you, I'm going to get you to do is to be committed to this and you know, make a discretionary contribution to this. Um, finally, this issue of accountability is really about consistent rewards and punishments, which suggests that running through the middle of the issue of accountability is the issue of standards, because you can't hold somebody accountable if there isn't a clear standard for what's required of them, which suggests somebody's performance is either above standard or below standard. And if it's about consistent rewards and punishments, it stands to reason that if somebody goes the extra mile, you reward them. If they're careful to act to standard, you, you thank them, you recognize them. If they're malevolent, if they deliberately do what's kind of unacceptable, you dismiss them. And if they're careless, you warn them. Now, if you look at this instrument from a log, just as in a logical order, it suggests that these two variables of means and ability are actually a precondition for you to hold somebody accountable. So there's there's kind of a dividing line that operates there, which suggests that, that this way of looking at things kind of articulates in two pieces, you know? And that suggests that in the process of empowering somebody, you can make one of two mistakes. You can make a hard mistake or a soft mistake. The hard mistake is really what happens when you treat means and ability issues as if they are accountability issues. In other words, the person, either doesn't have the means to do what's required of them, they're not able to do what's required of them, their performance is below standard, and you dismiss the person, or you give them a written warning. I mean, that's just too harsh. You can't do that. But then there's another mistake we make, the soft mistake. And the framing of the soft mistake is the exact inverse. It's to treat accountability issues as if they are means and ability issues. In other words, you've given the person all the means to do what's required of them. They're perfectly able to do what's required of them. Their performance is below standard. And you go and send them another course. Or you go and train them. Or you, you, give, you coach them. Or dare I say, I've seen this happen too. You give them some more means. Now, of these two mistakes, this hard mistake and the soft mistake, in my experience, in most corporates, the, 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 the one that we do most often is the soft mistake. And the one that is actually the most problematic, the most dangerous one, actually is the soft mistake. You know, it's, uh, and the, it's, it's the most dangerous for two reasons. First of all, it is, um, it, is, uh, it is kind of like leaving the rotten apple in the barrel. And second of all, you, you basically cultivate not an incremental suspension of control, which is what we're arguing for, for the organization. You cultivate an incremental um, in, increase of control um, you know because let's say for instance you're allowed to use a credit card and company business in the organization that you're part of you've been trained to do it you've got all the means and the ability um, uh, uh, Fred Harding 
uses his credit card to buy a holiday for himself and his entire extended family to the Maldives. And we are scandalized. We said, oh, Fred abused the credit card. We sent Fred on a corporate governance course. But because we know we can't do nothing, we take the credit cards away from everybody else. And that's the problem of the soft mistake. The soft mistake creates the conditions where we, on an ongoing basis, impose more and more control to deal with exceptions rather than holding people accountable. So, folks, what, what, so what, what we've concluded so far is, is, you know, if you look at how, how, um, you, you know, how organizations operate, we're saying this collective will only succeed if the, the granularity of it, if the average person is there to make a contribution. That translates into, the, in the first instance, if you did a horizontal cut through the organization, that team members are there to set each other up to succeed rather than competing with each other. So, but that in itself is then also dependent on how the hierarchy operates. So in other words, if you took a vertical cut through the organization, you're dealing with hierarchy. And in fact, that hierarchy will only succeed when the boss is there not to get something out of the subordinate, but to give something to the subordinate, namely the subordinate's caring growth. So what this is saying to you is that it doesn't matter where you are in the hierarchy, you, you're, you're, you're in a pincer movement. I mean, there's, insofar as you're operating a play, you know, you have peers. Don't be there for yourself. Be there to serve and give to them. And insofar as you're in a hierarchy, be there to give and serve your subordinates. In other words, give, give, give. No. You can legitimately say, well, good heavens. I mean, what's in it for me? You're asking me to cut my own throat here. You're asking me to become Mother Teresa. And in fact, not at all. I mean, if you, so, so in my experience, if you ask people, why do you go to work? I mean, you, you get, typically you get four kinds of answers. The first answer would sort of kind of relate to things like I get paid, I, you know, I, I, I earn a living, I can put my kids through school, I sort of pay the bond, keep a roof over my head. These are all concerns that are really concerned with security. The second theme that people would raise would be issues like, you know, well, I, you know, it's about learning, it's about being creative, it's about contributing to my development, my growth, it's fun. And so, so that theme is really about fulfillment or contentment. The third theme is one that people don't often kind of like to uh, admit to because it sounds a little bit politically incorrect, but, you know, it's definitely a feature, and that's really this idea that when we think about our life, we want to progress in the world, and progress, for most people, progress means going up in the hierarchy of life. In other words, very few of us are comfortable with the idea of dying a nobody. Everybody wants to die a somebody. We all wish to be significant in some way. So I want to build my career. I want to succeed. I want to leave a legacy. I want to, you know... I want to become somebody. And, and this, this sense of growth and of becoming bigger is therefore really hierarchical in character. It is about power. It's a competitive thing. The last reason why people go to work, and normally it's the one, because it's the politically correct answer, it's the one that sort of solicits the most information, it would be things like making a contribution, I have great colleagues, I want to make the world a better place, I want to develop my people, and in spirit, it's actually the opposite to the previous one, because the previous one has kind of like a competitive feel about it. This one has, if you like, a more kind of a collaborative feel about it. It's about making the world a better place. It's about harmony. Security, fulfillment, power, and harmony. That's why people do things. Well, the problem is that people don't realize, actually, the, 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 you can work as hard as you like for the rest of your life. You won't get those four things, because those four things aren't a product of what happens at work. Those four things are product of something that happens on the inside, because those four things are things you manufacture in your intent, and we can demonstrate them point by point. If you have a look at how your intent is structured, I mean, if you say that is me, um, as you can see, they got the picture, the, the artist got that a bit wrong, but that's me. And so there's myself, and in any situation, I'm surrounded by the other, by the world. Now, if we examine how my intent can operate, in any situation, I can either construct my intent on what I'm getting from the world, or I can construct my intent on what I'm giving to the world. Now, when I construct my intent on what I'm getting from the world, you know, when I get something from the other, what I'm getting get, goes from other to self. 
and I'm giving something, the thing that I'm giving moves from self to other. Now, there are absolutely dramatic implications for all four of these things with regard to where I construct my intent. I mean, let's assume I base my sense of security on what I'm getting from the world. In other words, um, uh, you know, some assets, um, an income, uh, you know, uh, a, a pension fund. If I base my security on anything that I get from the, from the world, you know, how often does the world that you're in give you exactly want, what you want at that particular point in time? Actually, very rarely. So if you want something from something else, you base your security on what you're getting from the other, you will stay insecure. Whereas if you base your security on the quality of what you're contributing, because you've always got control over the quality of what you're contributing, you'll always be secure. So the difference between being secure and insecure is not the assets. I mean, surely it's occurred to you by now, folks. I mean, you must have met very wealthy people in your life who are miserably insecure. There's absolutely no relationship between what you own and how secure you feel. Hmm? I mean, a, an asset that most dramatically demonstrates this is ownership of a house. I mean, we have this idea, we've paid off the bankers and the title deed to our house is in our own safe. We're secure, you know? Um, but now I mean, that's an interesting idea because if you think something makes you secure, you know, what does it promise to do? It promises to protect you. Like your house is gonna do that. So you arrive home this afternoon to the house, which you, we assume you own. You've paid the, 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 uh, the bankers, the title deed to the house is in your own safe. You walk up your garden path, you're five meters from your front door, and you get viciously attacked by a thug. Um, you know, I don't think your house is going to come to your defense. So to think that your house protects you is insane. I mean, no asset that you have has admitted any kind of custodial responsibility with regard to you. You know, nothing's going to, it's not going to come to your defense. Whereas let's assume you go into your house uh, this afternoon and you've, um, you, uh, you know, um, some, some vandal has gotten into your house and completely wrecked the place. You know, will you be upset? Um, yes, of course you'll be upset, you know. So, so who's there to look after? Are you there to look after the house? Was the house there to look after you? And clearly you're there to look after the house. I mean, Although not a single asset that you have has admitted any kind of custodial responsibility with regard to you, you've accepted a custodial responsibility with regard to every one of your assets purely by claiming ownership. In other words, folks, you don't own yourself into being secure. You own yourself into being insecure. The more things you own, the more things are going to get taken away from you. Exactly the same argument has to work for fulfillment. If I base my happiness on what I'm getting from the world, because the world really gives me what I want at that particular point in time, I'll stay discontented. Whereas if I base my happiness on the quality of my contribution, because I've always got control over that, I'll be fulfilled. This issue of power. Let's assume I want, we're in the same room and you have a watch and I want your watch. You know, um, so if I want your watch, who's got power over who? Clearly you've got power over me because you can withhold the watch. In other words, the moment you engage somebody on the basis of what you want from them, because you're constructing your intent on what sits here, you're weak and they're strong. The moment I shift my intent from what sits over here to how I can contribute, so I no longer want your watch, I shift my intent to how I can be helpful to you, you can't withhold the watch, I slip out from underneath your ability to manipulate me and I become powerful. Why? Because I'm giving attention to what I've got power over. Hmm. You know, in any situation, you only have power over what you're willing to give or lose. This is why you can't manipulate suicide bombers. If you have a look at what, how prices get set in markets, go to an auction, you see the price is going up, up, up. At some point, it's not going to go further. It gets stuck. When does that happen? When somebody says, I'm not willing to pay more. So the person who can lose the transaction defines the value of the transaction. The person who can't lose the transaction still stays negotiable. So the transaction will define them. This issue of harmony is a further implication to the, 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 the watch rule. Because if I want the watch, if I want your watch, your ability to withhold the watch gives you power over me, you're strong and I'm weak, I'm actually vulnerable to you. You can harm me. In other words, while I want the watch, you, um, I'm vulnerable to you. But not only am I vulnerable to you, but if I was really serious and I wanted to get the watch, you would experience me as dangerous to you. So while I want the watch, you are dangerous to me and simultaneously I'm dangerous to you. And when two people are dangerous with regard to each other, we'll have conflict with each other. 
the moment I shift my intent from what I'm trying to get from you to how I can be helpful to you, you can't withhold the watch. In other words, I'm safe from you. You can't manipulate me anymore. Not only am I safe from you, but precisely because I'm trying to be helpful to you rather than get something out of you, you are safe from me. So I'm safe from you and you safe from me. So, and when we're safe from each other, we're going to have harmony with each other. In other words, folks, the point I'm trying to make is that the things that you want from your life, security, fulfillment, power, and harmony, you manufacture those things inside your skin. You don't get them from work. You take them to work. There's no business, there's no job in the world that's going to give you those four things. You bequeath them to yourself based on your intent. So what do we argue? Uh, I don't know what happened there. Okay, the keynote unexpectedly quit. I, I beg your pardon, folks. Let me just find that presentation again. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's the wrong one. I beg your pardon. So there we go. I'm assuming you can still see this. Uh, we were over. Let me just get to the right slide at least. We were over here. Um, so, excellence, we're arguing, is really the product of the intent to give or serve. And what we've understood in our enterprise is that you need to be able to refract this into four contexts. First of all, you need to understand what this means for the entire enterprise. When the enterprise is there to serve its market, when it is there to make a contribution to the world, it is healthy. The problem is that the whole organization will only deport with the, uh, in terms of being there to make a contribution to the world when we get the granularity right, when what's happening in some with each individual is, is healthy. In the first instance, that has, to do, that has something to do with how teams operate, with how peers operate in a group. Because we now know that if, uh, if members of a team are, are, are in the team to pursue their own interests, you don't have a team, you've got a herd of cats. It is only when the member in the team is there to set their colleague up to succeed, has that magnanimity of spirit, then the team succeeds. We've also demonstrated that this issue of service is then also concerned with how hierarchy operates. The subordinates aren't there for bosses. Bosses are there for subordinates. They're there to care for and grow the subordinate. Now, <clears throat> these two variables of the, the, uh, the horizontal and the vertical intersect, obviously, at the level of the individual. And what we've also discovered is actually you achieve a sense of security and fulfillment on the basis of your intent to give. Um, which basically means to say that all human excellence is held together as all a dance around the same concern. And that is about cultivating uh, the intent to give or serve in the individual. Um, what we do as an enterprise, what Skatema does as an enterprise, is we basically help organizations to establish, you know, how and why they make a contribution to the world. We also help teams to succeed by creating the conditions where individuals in the teams are there to set each other up to succeed. We help hierarchies. We help bosses to basically, I beg pardon, uh, get uh, legitimize the relationship of power that they have with their subordinates. And we also then help individuals to achieve a fundamental sense of security and performance in their lives. And we do that across, if you like, four different service types. We help organizations diagnose. We help, uh, we, we consult to organizations to help them sh achieve the shift. We also train uh, groups and individuals and we coach groups and individuals to incrementally uh, achieve this excellence rooted in the intent to serve. Thank you very much, folks. Um, uh, if you wish to know any more about us, as a, I'll take, um, we, I am putting it down right now. This is um, my hours up. Thank you for your patience with me. I'll take uh, questions, I'll respond to questions in the, um, uh, in the chat box. Um, uh, clearly, if you need to leave, please do, um, obviously. Um, but if you wish to pursue, understand anything else about uh, our concern, 
Uh, you're very welcome to visit us at www.scotemgroup.com. Thank you very much, folks. So, uh, right, how do we avoid manipulative relationships in the give relationship when we give to others, but the others manipulate it for his or herself? So, um, what you'll remember in this, uh, when we looked at the, the uh, care and growth uh, idea, as we said, care, care and growth isn't just about being nice. Care and growth is actually about acting in the best interest of the other. You don't act in somebody else's best interest by allowing them to take, by allowing them to be takers. You remember that there was two pieces. There was the soft piece about this thing, but there was also the hard piece that is concerned with honesty and, in fact, accountability. In other words, you do nobody a favor by allowing them to be a taker. What you should be giving when somebody is a taker is you should be confronting them. Right. That's, that's what giving means. Giving isn't always about being nice. It's about being appropriate. It's about being willing to confront people when that is what they require. And if you aren't willing to confront people and that's what you require, then that says something about your weakness, about what you want to get out of the relationship. And it's probably actually their good opinion of you. It's hard when in the advertising industry and the marketing security and things that you can. Yeah, that's very interesting, uh, Hasnain, that uh, that is how we, they, they, they kind of deport this. And what people don't realize is that if you think that, 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 um, uh, that uh, security, fulfillment, all of these things are the product of having bought something, this is a little bit like drinking salt water for thirst. Because it is like you, it is like I think my assets make me secure, um, but because I've got more assets, I now become more insecure. So, so it's the the this liquid that I'm drinking, the assets, actually turn out to be salt water because I'm actually less secure after accumulating them than what I was before. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Abdullah. Um, right, folks. Uh, I can see we've sort of run out of uh, 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 questions. Um, thank you very much for your, your participation and uh, all the best. Uh, we'll, hopefully we'll chat again at some point.